Patrick, what's going on? Alex, hello everyone. Welcome to the program. Sorry for keeping you all waiting. Thanks for waiting patiently. Although I assume you're waiting patiently. I have no idea I wasn't here. So maybe it was very impatiently. And if that's the case, I apologize for the negative emotions that I may have caused. I should have said, I should have said, I said at the beginning of the year, I'm not responsible for any negative emotions. <laughs> Sign a waiver. What's going on? What's up? <laughs> Nothing much, man. It's Monday. And it's the Monday before Thanksgiving. I think on the canvas page, it says things going on this week are surprise Thanksgiving because I had no idea that next week was Thanksgiving break. I really thought it was like two or three weeks away. This is, this is, um, you, are, you guys get to watch every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday the disintegration of a mind into madness as, as I lose track of all sense of time and purpose with quarantine. But anyway, how are you guys doing? Uh, I've been all right. Nice to hear, Alex. How are you chilling? Uh, now I am. That my The last week, it was kind of... It's kind of hectic for me. Uh, I was working on one of the CS programs for a long time, but I'm glad it's over with and I'm ready to move forward. I, I heard about that CS program. What was the program, by the way? Uh, for It was for CS 2114. It was called Space Colonies. Oh, they've changed, they, they, they've changed the curriculum since I was there. I can tell you that much. Well, they definitely change the book every year. It saves you buying a new one. But <laughs> oh, they got their projects the same. I think back when I took that class, a long time ago, our Thanksgiving project was to make a music library. Like, there wasn't actually any music involved. It was just like make a GUI um, that you could like flip between that would like, it would accept like a bunch of music and it would order it however you wanted to order like alphabetically by artist or whatever it was by year. And then you could like flip between pages and like see your different music. Space Company sounds pretty cool though too. Yeah. No, we had the same thing. It was like uh, you could accept or like reject um, certain applicants that wanted to move onto a planet. So it's, I guess it's kind of like a similar concept. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. They, they, they just thought space colonies were, were more relevant. Maybe, maybe they thought back when I was in school, like, what's hot right now? Well, the MP3 player can hold thousands of songs. That's so relevant. No. <laughs> That's what the kids like. Even though Spotify was very much ingrained in culture by then. But anyway... Um, what was the point? Oh yeah, so do you guys have to like test this week? Because I know Thanksgiving, the, the week before Thanksgiving is usually when like five classes give tests. Uh, mine was um last week actually, so uh, I'm pretty. I just got like maybe one or two presentations, and then I should be chilling. Nice, Alex and Patrick. Uh, I think it's mostly projects for me, unless I'm I'm missing something. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, cool. Well, sorry my test was part of that, but um, hey, it's over now, so you guys have to enjoy the week before Thanksgiving. And let's enjoy it together by continuing our conversation today. Actually, I say continuing. We're just straight up starting a new conversation today. We are leaving induction behind, and we're talking about my good friend, Sets. And this is... The lines, the lines have returned. Sets, there we go. And um, this is section 6.1. For those of us following along in the book. And the weird thing is, sets are in chapter 6.1. So they're not in chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, even though we have used the concept of sets so 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 many times and uh, let, let's just get in let's just get into talking about these things more rigorously now even more rigorously than, than we've been doing it so far so i'll say um definition so the definition of a set that i'm going to give you is that 
a set is a mathematical object that contains elements. This is like the broadest definition you can give. Contains elephants, or uh, and not, well, it could contain elephants, but elements is what I meant to say. It contains elements, um, and elements, these are just things inside your set. So not to make you throw up from last week, but this is like, this is like you could think of a set as a data structure. Almost right, like computer science, where um, like you know you have lists and you have arrays and things like that, and they all work slightly differently or in different ways. Well, a set is essentially a data is essentially kind of a data structure in the sense that um, it contains a certain group of elements, and it does so in some interesting ways. But let's first do an, do an example. I would ask if anyone has any questions, but I think this is like this is there's not a lot that can go wrong here. Any questions? I'll ask anyway. All right, so for an example, you could have this set right here that contains the elements 1, 5, 9, 13, 17, 21, on and on and on like that. Now you always put curly braces around a set that's how you know it's a set and so the set is s like this whole thing is the set the set is the collection it is the grouping and then the elements are these cats right here and everything else that would be in our set based on this pattern the important thing to note is that everything, and I mean everything, is either in or not in what some might call out And then we talked, we, talked, we talked about this before. This is what makes a set different from like arrays or lists or things like that. And that is that everything is either in a set or not in a set. And there's nothing in between or more than that. Nothing can be in a set twice. A set just tracks if things are in or out. So it makes no sense. So the set, if you had a set, like if you had T equals one, three, one, four, five, three, right? I mean, you could write it that way and it wouldn't be wrong, but what that really equals in a more simplified notation is one, three, four, five. We forget about the extra one and the extra three because a set, this set right here, the way you read this is this is the set that contains one, it contains three, it contains one, it contains four, it contains five, it contains three, and nothing else. But saying it contains one twice doesn't mean it extra contains one. There's not more ones in the set than three. It makes no sense. A set just contains things or doesn't contain things. There's no in between. So what I'm saying here is that everything Uh, or actually nothing <laughs> the exact opposite of everything nothing can be in a set multiple times or a fraction of times Um, everything is simply exactly in or exactly out. 
The point being, you can't say like, oh, this is kind of in my set. No, it's either in or it's out. It's time to be decisive. And sets are a very, very decisive thing. Things are in a set or things are out of a set. And that is what a set is. And this is why I say this is like the definition that I give to a set. Because a set, we've finally gotten to the bottom of math. This is where it all leads. Everything in math is defined in terms of sets. I've been telling you guys forever that there's like seven to eight. That actually, some people choose an eighth. It's a whole thing. It's called the axiom of choice. But there's seven to eight axioms that are at the bedrock of all math. And these are the assumptions that everything else in math is built on. Well, every single one of those assumptions is about sets. That, that's what they are about. Like there's the, no integers are mentioned in those assumptions. And that's because the integers can actually be built from sets. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Sadly, I'll get too into that. But um, everything in math is built from sets. We're now at the bottom. But what that means is once you get to the bottom, um, things start becoming kind of circular because you know it's like an even number is any number that's divisible by two. All right, that's a good definition as long as you know what a number is and what two is, right? Um, and you go, oh, okay, well, you know, we know what a number is. A number can be defined in terms of sets, right? And so can two. And so we kind of have that. But then you go, okay, that's a good definition as long as you know what sets are. And therein lies the crux of the problem, right? Human beings, we can't keep infinitely backtracking and defining. There's some point where the buck stops, and the buck stops here at sets. And so I'm calling a set as a mathematical object that contains elements, but that's how we think about it. And that's kind of what it is. But um, it's kind of circular once you start defining sets because they're at, they're at the bottom. And so uh, sets are just a thing that we assume to exist. We assume that objects exist in this sort of way and they work from it. The point being, you might see some more hoity-toity definition somewhere, maybe in terms of functions and things like that. But anyway, this is the definition we're going with because it makes the most sense. And it's like the first one you know. And you guys don't need to know any of this rant I'm having right now. You can forget all of this. The point is there are, there are really interesting things happening here. But this is what a set is. Any questions so far? This feels, I feel like, this feels like I'm, I'm saying really basic things, but it's important. All right. So, um, let's talk notation a little bit. So all the year we've been saying like X is in the natural numbers or X is not in something, right? We were saying in and not in all the time. And you might've thought there should be a symbol for this. And there is, yay. And that goes like this. So I'll say to say, uh something is in a set we use this symbol right here when i've seen it before i mean it's like it's, it's kind of hard to describe it's basically like a c with a little line in it but it's kind of a bigger c it's like a little trident kind of thing and then to say something is not in a set. Any guesses on the symbol we use? Exactly, right? Just like everything else in math. We just use the end symbol, but say no, no, not that. <laughs> yeah. It's classic humans, right? It's like we like 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 you know whenever, whenever you want someone not to do something with like an aerosol can, you always like draw what they're gonna do. Like you say, like don't don't sit here with a with a, with the can and with a match and light things on fire. They draw it and they say, don't do that. <laughs> it's actually the same thing here, right? 
do the interval, but but not that. <laughs> so anyway, sixteen thing is not a set. We use that symbol right there. So for example, in our case, we have S up here. If we look at S, right, we have that one is an S. We have that five is an S. We have that nine is an S. We have that 13 is an S. We have that 17's an S. We have that 21's an S, on and on and on. So, so this symbol just means this is an element of S. So I'll write right here that X in S means either X in S, or you could say X is an element of S if you want to be fancy. But same, same idea. All right. Now the other way around is a number like two, for example, is not an S, and three is not an S, and zero is not an S. And hey, pi is not an S. And hey, uh, let's say negative 45 is not an S. The square root of two is not an S. Um, 15 times the square root of negative one, which you call, which you could call I, is not in S. Really, if X is in, well, actually, I, I, I don't want to say that, but, but, but really, if X is any single real or complex number that's not 1, 5, 9, 13, 17, 21, or completing the pattern, it's not going to be an S. So you can write this about anything. Is there anything else other than every complex number that's not in here, that's not in S? That kind of covers it, right? In fact, no, there's infinitely, infinitely more things that are in S. So what about the matrix? Zero, one, one, zero, that's not in S. What about the function, right? F of X equals X squared. This is a thing. You can think of functions as things. There's, there's sets of functions, but that's not an S. Um, <laughs> oh, you can go, you can go to anything. The word goat, if you define this correctly, is not an S. Is the null set an S? Excellent question. No. But we're going to get to that by, by, by the end of class. Keep them in the back of your mind. That's a good, that's a good question. Because that's a whole thing with subsets versus being in. But anyway, yes. So literally everything. This is why I underlined everything. I mean everything is either in or not in our set S. So if it is a thing, it's not 1, 5, 9, 30, 70, 20, whatever, whatever. It's not an S. I am not an S, for example. Even though I aspire to be as beautiful and pure as number five, for example. <laughs> anyway, these are sets. Going slow, building a foundation. It's only the foundation of all of man. And by the way, I mean, just to get meta for a second, like, they, like telling you guys about like, like what, what's supposed to be happening in your brain right now. I, there's, a, there's a theory of, of learning, education, things like that. And I, totally, I totally buy it. And that is people don't live, people don't learn in a linear fashion in the sense that the way we teach people is oftentimes linear in the sense of like, oh, now you know algebra and then you can know trig and then you can know calculus and then you can know whatever, then whatever, then whatever, right? And it goes in a very, very linear fashion. But people don't really learn linearly. They, they learn more in like a circle, a circle, where you have like kind of theory slash definitions down here, and you kind of have applications up here. And it's all for the purpose of 
strengthening your mental model of what's going on. And so the weird thing is sets, right, don't exist. You can't go into nature and observe a set. A set is a thing that human beings have created. It's this idea that uh, if you can imagine the space of everything, you're looking at everything. A set is just you looking at everything and just taking a few of those things and holding them in their arms and going, this is my set. This, these are the things we care about. Just these things right here, nothing else. Like that's a set. And once again, I just gave you kind of a different theory idea, the way to look at it. And then we're gonna do more examples, which gives you more application. Theory application, theory application, theory application. We've already used sets a bunch. So I actually started with the application. Now we're talking about the theories and the definitions, but this just goes in a circle, a circle, a circle, a circle. And so the point is, um, if you didn't understand sets when we first started, like you were kind of confused by them, well, hopefully now that we're down here, it'll help a little bit. And we'll do more examples that'll help. And here, and then maybe, may, and, and, and you will most likely by the end of this class not really understand sets to the fullness they could be understood. And that's okay. I mean, that's how the circle works, right? You're, you're, you hopefully will go into other classes, right? Where you see like graph theory, where you'll see more sets, see more applications of them, right? And then you'll build it deeper. And then you see those applications, and you go and you kind of review the definition, you start to see the richness of it, or whatever, and then it comes back around. I mean, this is, the, I, mean, I mean, this kind of makes sense, right? I'm just kind of, like, like this, this is the path that we're on, is the point right here. And this, this, this is how you guys learn, or, or everyone learns, I guess. Yeah. Does it make sense? I think it makes sense. Like, uh, like Safa, what, what, what's, what's something you're good at? Fantasy football. What do you say? Fantasy football. Fantasy football, yeah. Like when you first started fantasy football, right? You had probably some idea going in what it was. But then like that first year you played it, right? You learned a lot more about it than you knew going in. Like even looking at the rules, right? Yeah. And then the next year you play it, you probably go back and you look at the rules and you realize why well, some are there and what's going on, right? And then it gives you a better understanding of, of just like the setup. And then you play again. And you start seeing more things happening and it goes like this is like a board game right this is why it's like hard to describe a board game in full which is why you have to play it oh uh, you have to play it to, to understand why everything's there and how everything works together um and that, that's exactly how math is honestly it's like it's like we need the applications and we need the theory we need both but anyway so um let's now talk set notation So for sets with finitely, finitely many elements, we can just write them down. For sets with finitely many elements, we can just write them down. An example being, if we had the set A equal one, two, three, seven, for some reason. Right? Actually, it's getting even weirder. Let's say it's a set of one, two, three, the matrix one, zero, zero, two, and um, negative pi, why not? And this is a set. And this tells you everything you need to know. Because remember a set, right? Either has everything, but everything is either in a set or out of the set. And so whatever notation you use to write down the set, it should be very clear and very obvious how to determine an element in it or not in it. And if for finding the elements, well, we can do that right here. Like, ask me a question. Is one in the set? Yeah, one's in. Is two? Yeah, three? Yeah. The set one, zero, zero, one? No. The set one, zero, zero, two? Yeah. Pi? No. Negative pi? Yeah. Right? You just go through and, and you just match it up with here. And so it's in a set if it's one of these. It's not in a set if it's not one of these. 
Excuse me. But for sets with infinitely many elements, or for practical purposes, just a, just a very large set. That'd be hard to write down. We should use more advanced set notation. And so even the ass I showed you before, I kind of screwed you guys a little bit with that. Like the ass I showed you before that the set ass was, what was it? It was one, five, nine, 13, 17, 21, on, on like that. This is not really proper set notation. Like you could get away with it in a, in a lot of contexts because people just, like if you were in the actual math field, you could probably get away with it for the most part just because it's like people, people don't want to be sticklers necessarily. But so the question is, can this, can this definition, right, of this set be used to determine if something in the set or out of the set? Well, one's in the set. So that's fine. Is five in the set? Yeah. Is nine? Yeah. 13? Yeah. 17? Yeah. 21? Yeah. What about two? I don't think so, right? You don't think so because I, I wrote it in order, but sets don't really have an order necessarily, right? I mean, they could just be whatever. Maybe a better example to really say it would be 23. I mean, it could maybe it's in the dot, dot, dots, right? How do you know? And the answer of how you know is because there's a pattern here, right? What, 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 what's the pattern in these numbers? Start with one at four. Start with one at four. A better and and even more succinct way to say it is that it's uh, multiples of four plus one, right? Like zero is multiple of four, or I'll say non-negative multiples of four plus one. Zero is multiple of four plus one is one. Four is multiple of four plus one is five. Eight plus one is nine. Twelve plus one is thirteen. Sixteen plus one is seventeen. Twenty plus one is twenty-one. That's really what's going on here, and so since we know the pattern. A much better way to write sets is to write them like this. And this is the set notation. So in this case, we'd say, we're going to say all in and the natural numbers such that n equals 4k plus 1 for some k and z. This is proper set notation, and I've used it before a little bit in this class. And here's the way that you read this. So I'll say, in general, X is in A. I'm sorry, nope, I don't want to write that. A equals X and D such that P of X, and this bar still means P of X, right? This means that an element is in A, if it's in D, such that P of X is true. And it's not in X, if it's not in D, or P of X is not true, right? But this is to be read just like our normal um, formal statements, right? This is saying A, so this is saying, this is saying, that A is the set of all elements of D such that P of X is true. So it's a set of all elements of D since the P of X is true. 
So you're in the set if you're an element of D, so the P of X is true, and you're not in if you're not that. So X is in A, if and only if X is in D, and P of X is true. And then X is not in A, if and only if X is not in D, but we don't have P of X. That's just the negation of the above by De Morgan's law. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is how you read set notation. And the beautiful part about this is we've kind of talked about this over and over and over again. This is kind of the difference between method of exhaustion and direct proof. Where the difference between method of exhaustion is you just go through individually and show for each one what's up. So this is like the method of exhaustion situation, right? For each number in the set, we just literally write it down and say it's in it, right? But that won't work for infinite sets, just like method of exhaustion will work to prove things about an infinite set. So we need to use a more general form to describe this. And this is the general form. This is all in a natural number such that n equals 4k plus 1 for some k and z. And that way, there's no confusion here. You give me any number. Like, there was some concern over the number. Erase this. There was some concern over the number uh, 23. Is 23 in the set? Well, let's see. 23 is an N. But does 23 equal 4K plus 1? For some k and z, well, let's say proof by contradiction. Assume it did. So there exists a k and z such that 23 equals 4k plus 1. Well, let's track one from both sides to get that 22 equals 4k. And then subtracting um, or dividing both sides by 4, this would imply that k equals 22 over 4, which equals 11 halves, which equals 6 and one half. So this is a contradiction because k, the one thing we know about k is that it's an integer. I think it's five and a half, but point two. Oh, six. <laughs> Thank you. Alex. Yeah. yeah. So k is an integer. So it cannot also be five and one half as five and one half is clearly not an integer. The point is, any number you give me, I can either verify for you that's in the set based on this definition, or I can verify you that's not in the set. That's what makes this a better definition than this. Because this is this is perfect in the sense it does what you want it to do. Maybe there's, maybe there's a better way to write it, but I'm saying this really does um, clearly write down the set. It tells you what's in it, what's in it. Uh oh, what's that about? Good. Well, battery came on, that was dangerous. But my, my computer, I think I told you guys, my, my, my computer, it'll tell me I have low battery exactly four seconds before it shuts down. <laughs> so that quickly. Uh, bu, bu, bu. Yeah. So let's do another example of how you write things formally. Let's say that T were to equal um, the set, let's call it one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, on, on, on. Let's say you want to write this set, but what am I trying to write? Like, 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 what am I getting at here? What's the pattern? 
Is it Fibonacci initialized with one and two? Actually, you can think of it that way. In fact, the way I think, the way I'm going to think about it is this is Fibonacci initialized with one and one, like usual. It's just T. What I'm trying to write is. So first of all, let's define the Fibonacci sequence again. So I'll say f of one equals one, f of two equals two, f of three, sorry, no. And then after that, f of n is going to equal f of m minus one plus f of m minus two, we're all in greater than or equal to three. Just defines the sequence, right? I'm oh, sorry, wait, I want to write this. There you go. So, so this totally defines the sequence because to calculate f of three, for example, I do the two previous, one plus one, which is two. To calculate f of four, I do the, the two previous, two plus one, which is three. It gets me this. So in a certain sense, I want to write this to be every number that shows up in the Fibonacci sequence. And now one just up twice, because the, the, the sequence starts off, I mean, this ends up being one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, on, on, on. So one just up twice, remember we don't care about that, right? A set either contains something or doesn't contain something. So since one shows up in the Fibonacci sequence, it's in our set, but it's not in our set twice or anything like that. But it looks confusing, right? So once again, though, this is like neither of these things are as rigorous, right? Like if I give you number 17. <laughs> um, so here's the way you would write this rigorously, right? Fibonacci numbers, I mean, they're all integers, right? So it's the set of all integers in N such that actually I'm going to write this as M. Set of all M in the natural numbers such that M equals F of N for some N in Z. And hey, I can start writing this again. I have so trained myself to not write this symbol. I've been writing IN that even my, in my math research and things like that, I've started writing N instead of the symbol and I start looking weird. But anyway, most people always use this symbol because it's easier. Does that make sense? I mean, this is how you would write this really formally. <laughs> I think it's making sense. I hope this makes sense. I think it's going slow enough. Everything is gelling. Um, oh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Do we have to restrict? Oh, never mind, right? Like, if, if Z is. Wait, so we don't have to restrict Z to be like from one to infinity for the N as an element of Z? Good question. Good question. Good question. It, it, it probably would make more sense to write a natural number here. Um, you could write in just the general integer too, because f of zero just straight up doesn't exist. There is no f of zero. So you don't have to worry about some number equaling f of zero. It just wouldn't happen, right? Um, yeah, so that, so, I mean, so that's fine. I mean, it's like technically you could even write like the real numbers if you wanted, because again, F is only defined on the natural numbers, F of one, F of two, F of three, F of four, only natural number indices. Um, and so the set of M and N is that M is F for some N and R, I mean, that's fine because we're never gonna get confused. We're never gonna have some number that equals F of one half or F of pi or F of square root of two. It's just not gonna happen. Um, but why confuse people? Why not just write this? 
Okay, that makes sense, right? So it's like, it only really cares about the conditions that this is true in, in any case, right? Exactly. I'll just um, but I, I guess also not vacuously true, like actually true, true, or? Um, right, because like, um, you could make some kind of, like, I guess the concern is, right, if you could make some kind of argument that it not existing means it's false and kind of like are undefined and vacuously true. I see what you're um, we can we can save the nitpick so, for later. So and I, I, think, I think I think you're using the word vacuously correctly in terms of well, how it makes me feel <laughs> in terms of the thing you get inside. But vacuously true really only applies to certain situations. And as far as I'm aware, this is not one of them. We will get to one later in, the, in this lecture in a few minutes here of where vacuously true does apply. But um, like, like in the sense that we, we use the word vacuously in very specific circumstances. So in, in a case where like something would never happen, so like, like, like you're totally right. So if you're, so if you're talking about let's use um, M and the natural numbers such that M, um, such that M is even and M equals three. Well, that's just not gonna happen, right? So this is the empty set. Um, but we don't go like, oh, this is just never going to happen. So in a certain sense, it's vacuously true or something like that. No, don't worry about that. Va vacuously right now, right now, just think about vacuously as, uh, only applying to conditional statements. Applying to conditional, and we're going to apply to a few other things and then, um, we'll start to see, but really, you'll, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. Okay, cool, cool. Just checking. Yeah, that's a good question. All right. So real quick, there's one more way that you can write sets that are that's fine and all formal and stuff like that. And the way you do that is you kind of use the form. I'll write it up here. You kind of went over this already. Another valid form goes like this. Um, so saying that A equals the set of X and D such that P of X is true. We could also write that as A, actually forget X and D is that. We can write a set as some transformation of X such that X is in D and some P of X is true. And this looks weird. That's because we need to do examples. We're at the bottom of the circle. We're going to talk to some applications. So, in this case right here, this is really a long-winded way to write this. Because we say n's a natural number, such that n equals 4k plus 1 to some k and z. Uh, well, as long as k is greater than or equal to 0, 4k plus 1 is going to be a natural number guaranteed. So we're kind of we're kind of just saying more than we need to. We're not over-constraining our system, but um, we're just kind of being a little redundant. And so maybe a better way to write this, the way I would write this in the real world in real math, the way I'd write this is I'd say this equals 4k plus one, the set of all things that are that of the form 4k plus one, um, such that k is in z and k is greater than or equal to zero. That's basically how I'd legitimately write this um, in some math research or whatever you're doing in like real math. Uh, and so this first part, right, is kind of like the form. 
the form of the number you're talking about in this part uh, restricts your variables to particular things, whatever you want. So another option, if you had t equals the thing we had t equal to 4, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, on, on, like that. How'd you guys write that in this new kind of notation? Well, the way we, well the way you think about this is just go, what is everything in my set? Like 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 ra ra rather than beating around the bush and saying like, oh, what's the general set that my elements are in, and then specifically what kind of elements they are. I mean, that's what this is, right? You say, okay, generally, elements of my set are natural numbers, but specifically they're this. And you just of, write in like the sequence definition such that the range is valid. Yeah, or, or, or I mean, sorry. We would always have F defined. So we'd have like F of one equals one, F of two equals one, F of N equals F of N minus one, plus F of N minus two, for all N grade equal to three. So you have a def definition, you just go, okay, well, what's everything in my set? Everything in my set is a Fibonacci number. Okay, so they're all Fibonacci, so the, it's a set of all Fibonacci numbers such that n comes from it. What am I doing? What am I doing? We'll pass this. There we go. So, yeah, so. Both both ways of writing things like this or like this, totally valid. It's just whatever one's easier, honestly. Sometimes the reason why it would be easier is because sometimes it's hard to pinpoint where like Fn or where this, where this transformation will be. It's sometimes, sometimes hard to pinpoint where that'll be. And it's easier just to say how you build it from things over here. So you build f of n from natural numbers, but just subscripts. You build this from 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 this by multiplying by four, adding one. It's 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 kind of like that, but both are fine. All right, now we get to move on to subsets. Yes. So far, we've been dealing with sets. Now let's talk about subsets. And by the way, I should mention, you can have sets within sets. You can have sets within sets. That's totally fine. So I could define A to be a set that contains one, two, three, for example. And I could define B to be a set that contains the number pi, it contains two, it contains negative four, it contains the set A, it contains the matrix one, zero, zero, one, it contains the set of 4K plus one, such that K is in Z and K is greater than equal to zero. Um, it, it could contain five, right? This is fine, right? Like once we have a set, we could think of a set as a thing on its own. And so you could put it in a set, right? Because sets are things that, our sets are just collections of things. But a set's a thing, so it's fine to have a set within a set. It gets confusing, but it's okay. Now, now let's talk about subsets. So to say a subset, we're always going to use this form right here. This is the symbol. This symbol means A is a subset of B. So I'll say, we say 
A is a subset of B, or A is contained in B if and only if every element of A is in B. So for example, the set one, two, three is a subset of the set negative one, zero, one, two, three, four. This set's a subset of this set because, I mean, obviously this makes sense, doesn't think that this is just a smaller collection of this, but everything in here is in here. That's fine. So one, two, three is a subset of negative one, zero, one, two, three, four. That's totally true. Um, yeah. So what I'll say is formally, uh, A is a subset of B, if and only if, for all X and A, we have that X is in B. That makes sense, right? Well, this sort of means to be a subset. I mean, we can't think of a subset as it's like, it's a subset, right? It's a smaller collection or the same size it could be that contains the same elements, right? I mean, it's, you, you take your collection, that's B, you take part of that, that's A, A subset of B. But really what that means, the way you, what, what it means to be a subset really is that, oh, everything in A is in B. That's what makes it a subset. That's what makes it like you took part of it. Um, yeah. So let's note something really important here, though. Something very important. Let's do three examples. First one, we're going to have A equals one, two, three, and we're going to have B equals one, two, or we're going to have negative one, zero, one, two, three. In our next example, we're going to have A equals one, two, three, and we're going to have B equal the set of negative one, zero, one, and then also the set one, two, three. And then maybe a final example is we'll have A equals the set one, two, three, and we'll have B equals negative one, zero, one, two, three, one, two, three. And our final set, we'll have A equals one, two, three, and we'll have B equals negative one, zero, one, two, three, four, All right, what's going on here is the question. How is A and B related? So, is A a subset of B in this first example? Yes. Yeah, totally, A is a subset of B. Because every element of A is in B. One's in A, it's in B. One's in A, or two's in A, it's in B. Three's in A, it's in B. So here we have that A is a subset of B. Is A in B? It is not. A is not in B. 
because B doesn't contain the set one, two, three. It contains the elements one, two, three, but does it contain the set one, two, three? This becomes more obvious when we get to this example. This example is A and B. It is. Yeah, right? A is one, two, three. And one of the elements of our set is one, two, three. So A is in B. Is A a subset of B? It is not. Exactly. In this case, A is not a subset of B because to be a, to be a subset, you need every element of A to be in B. Well, let's take the element of A to be one. Well, one's not in B. Right, like you could think of this as a black box. This is just a set. And so even though one is in this set, right, this is not equal one. So one is equal negative one, one is not equal zero, and one does not equal the set one, two, three. So therefore one is not in B. Same with two, same with three. So A is, A is not a subset of B. How about in this case, is A a subset of B here? It is. Yeah. A is because in addition to the set one, two, three, we also just sort of have the numbers one, two, and three in our set. So one's in A, one's in B, one or two's in A, two's in B, three's in A, three's in B. So A's in B. We also have that A is in B, right? Because the actual set A just straight up shows up here. Finally down here, is A in B? It is not. It is not. Because A is the set one, two, three. Does negative zero, does negative one equal the set one, two, three? No. Does zero equal the set one, two, three? No. Does the set one, two, three, four equal the set one, two, three? No, it does not. It always does, but it doesn't. So A is not in B here. Is A contained in B? No. It's not. Because in order to be contained in B, every element of A has got to be in B. Well, one's element of A is one in B. Well, one doesn't equal negative one, one doesn't equal to zero, and one doesn't equal to set one, two, three, four. So that's enough. So A is a nice subset of B. Uh, what time is it? One more minute. I'll do one more thing. By the way, sorry, does this, does this make sense? I think, I think, what do we have? Patrick says, yes, there we go. Patrick um, is the tastemaker of this class. So I'll say that's good. So one last day before we leave. Uh, yeah, we'll get this out of the way. So how to prove A is contained in B. Well, first example, first idea is method of exhaustion. So, um, for example, let A equal the set negative one, zero, and one. Prove that A is a subset of C. It's really easy. Actually, even better yet. Let's just say A is a subset. Let's A equal that and B equal, um, let's say negative two, negative one, zero, one, something like that. Our goal is to prove that A is a subset of B. Proof. Um, notice that, so really what we're trying to prove here, right? This is a statement that this says that for all X in A, X is in B. Literally, that's what this subset means. This is how it's defined. It means for all X in A, X in B. 
So proving universal statement. So let's note that if X is an element of A, then X equals negative one, X equals zero, or X equals one. So let's explain the cases. Case one, X equals negative one. Then since negative one is in B, just by looking at it, X is in B. Case two, we have X equals zero. Then since zero is in B, X is in B. Case three, X equals one. Then since one is in B, X is in B. Thus, by method of exhaustion, for all X in A, X is in B. Look at me. For all X in A, X is in B. Thus, A is contained in B. Kind of went quickly. But that's because I, I think this part was obvious, right? This is method of exhaustion proof. You literally just go through every element and check it works out. Clearly, what's the problem we're going to run into here? Well, there's infinite cases with infinite what if we sets? have infinite sets, right? Like, what if A is infinite? What's going to happen? That's what we'll do next time. You can mull it over, but I think you guys know where it's going. Anyway, any more questions? Uh, can I talk to you about something after class? Sure. Okay. Anybody else? Well, have a great Monday, everybody. Enjoy your last week for Thanksgiving break. Your last week of hybrid classes or anything? Because after that, we're going online for two weeks, aren't we? Look at that. You guys sad or happy? I mean, all my stuff was online in the first place, so it doesn't really change. Oh, that's nice, Safa. <laughs> Take care, Professor. You're welcome, Safa. Have a good day, everybody. Uh, so I was thinking oh, about the undergraduate research 